In today's experiment, we are going to look at density of some solids. Now, common examples of density that uh, are around are balloons. Anytime you have a party, basically you tend to have balloons around. The balloons float because they are filled with helium, which has got a lower density than air. That's why the balloons rise. Another common example of our effects of density is having uh, ice and water, ice floats on water, because ice has a lower density than water. Whenever there's an oil fire, we don't want to put that out with water because oil has got a lower density than water and as a result the oil is going to float on top of water. Instead of putting out the water, it's just going to spread the water. Now, how do we define density? We define it as mass divided by volume. So, all we need to do is get the mass, divide by the volume, and we obtain our density. Now, why would we want to measure density? It's a physical property of a material which can be used to help in identification of a substance. When I say physical property, basically, I mean it's a property which can be observed without changing the material into something else. I need to emphasize here that density is just one of the measurements that you need to take. Of, it's just one um, of the measurements used to identify material. You have to collect several measurements, different properties. These properties could be chemical or physical. Now, the difference between chemical and physical is, as I said, in physical, you measure how you observe that property without changing the material. In a chemical property, when you observe it, actually the material is changed into something else. So that's another reason why density is good, in that you can actually measure it without destroying your substance. Now, because uh, we define density as mass divided by volume, it does not depend on size. So whether you've got a small piece of material or a huge piece of material, so long as it's a pure material, the density is going to be the same. The density does not depend on size. Now, what do you need to measure density? One, you need the mass, and two, you need the volume. So what we are going to do then is, of course, to uh, see how do you obtain the mass. We use a scale or a balance to obtain that, and this is the kind of balance you're going to use. When you come in front of you, you'll see there's a button there labeled zero. Just press that once. Don't press it for so long because you'll throw off the calibration. And don't press any other button. Just press the button labeled zero, and it should settle to zero. Uh, there may be a bit of fluctuation in the last place of decimal, but that's okay. P take your object and place it in the balance. Again, give it time to settle, and take your reading. That will be the mass. Again, if you have a little bit of fluctuation in the last digit, that's okay. Now, there is a difference between mass and weight. And most of the time, we may be told, go and weigh something. Uh, what you actually obtain here is the mass. The mass uh, is basically the quantity of matter in your substance, whereas the weight is the force of the gravitational force on this material. So there is a difference between mass and weight. So we've seen now how we can obtain the mass. And to get the density, of course, we need the volume. So we are going to learn two ways in which we can obtain volumes of materials. One is basically measure the dimensions directly. So like in today's experiment, we are going to be working with uh, rectangular iron blocks like these ones. And so you just need a ruler to measure the dimensions. And the dimensions are length width and height. See, the longer side is the length, and then there are these two sides which are of approximately the same length in this case, but we'll read one of them as width and the other one as height. Use your ruler. You learned how to use this in experiment one. Again, set it there. What I really want you to be careful about is the accuracy with which you can read this ruler. The data you get, or the measurement you have, should have two places of decimal. So if your ruler happens to end right on a number, something like, say, 4, you cannot just record it as 4. That's wrong. You've got to say 4.00. So all your length measurements, I expect to see those um, recorded in two places of decimal. 
Once you've got the measurements, you can calculate the volume by multiplying your length times width times height. That should give you the volume. Since these measurements are in centimeters, your volume is going to be in centimeters cubed. One centimeter cubed is equivalent to a milliliter. In case you see the word milliliter used or centimeter used, know that those two are the same. One centimeter cubed is equivalent to a milliliter. So that's one way of obtaining the volume. Another way of obtaining the volume is by method of water displacement. So you take a measuring cylinder like this, put in some water. The actual amount of water you put in doesn't matter, but you want it somewhere between 60 and 70 milliliters. If you have less than that, then when you put your object in, it's not going to be fully immersed in the water. But if you put too much, then uh, the water is going to overflow. So about uh, 60 milliliters should be fine. Once you put the water in there and look at the surface of the water, you'll notice that it is curved. It's not flat. That curvature or that curving the surface of the water is what we call the meniscus. And when you try to look at it, when you place it down and try and look at it, you'll see that the meniscus, the bottom of the meniscus actually varies as you move. And what we want to do is to read the bottom of the meniscus. So we have to read it in such a way that the bottom does not appear to move. That apparent movement is what we call parallax error, and we want to avoid that. So when you're reading this, don't just take it and you know, hold it like that. You want to make sure that it's vertical. And the best way to do that is put it on a flat surface, and then get down so that your eye is right directly in line with the bottom of the meniscus and take the volume. All the volumes you read from this should be accurate to 0.1 of a milliliter. Okay, so make sure that uh, you check on that. Once you've taken that, you want to immerse your object. You want to put your object in that and you want to make sure your object is completely covered by water. Don't just drop it because you're going to break the cylinder. So what you want to do is turn it and then let this drop gently. Don't turn it too much, otherwise you'll spill the water. You don't want to spill any of the water because remember you've already read the volume and that volume is important. You don't want to spill the water. Now, once you immerse your object in the measuring cylinder, you'll notice that the volume has uh, increased because now you've got something else there. So read the new volume again. Avoid parallax. Read it by getting it just like we read before, getting your eyes right in level with the bottom of the meniscus. And so you'll have two volume readings. You've got the reading before you put an object in and the reading after you immerse your object in. The difference uh, in your readings will give you the volume of the material. So now we know how to obtain the mass and we know how to obtain the volume. Uh, this particular method of obtaining the volume is useful when you have non-irregular uh, objects, objects that don't have very regular shapes. You can't measure their dimensions, so you can use the method of water displacement. Once we've obtained those two, now we can just calculate the density by taking the mass and dividing that by uh, the volume. So in today's experiment, basically, what you're going to do is to obtain the density of iron by the two methods I've shown you, direct measurements and method of water displacement. After that, you are going to obtain the density of your unknown. Again, obtain the mass and the volume, use method of water displacement, and obtain the density. Once you've got your densities, as I said, density is a characteristic of a material, and iron has a specific density, 7.85 grams per uh, centimeter cubed, and that's given to you in the table at the end of the experiment in the lab manual. So obtain the density of your iron uh, bar from there, or obtain the density of iron there, and compare your measured densities with the one given in the table and as I said, you want to make sure that your relative error is within 5%. The third experiment you want to do is now to obtain the density of an unknown material. Now, the unknown materials you're going to get are these cylindrical bars of metal. There's a number here. Make sure you record the number because we'll need that to grade uh, your work. Measure the mass of this uh, Unknown, so again, go to the balance and measure the mass. Once you've done that, 
measure its volume by the method of water displacement. Divide the mass and the volume, and you should get the density of your unknown metal. Once you've done that, uh, you want to have an idea of what metal this is, go back to the table that I referred to you earlier on. There's a table at the end of this experiment. Look at the densities there, see which one is closest to your measured value. And then you can say that your unknown corresponds to that one. So again, the way you identify your unknown in this experiment is to look, first of all, measure the density of your unknown, compare it to the densities given uh, in the lab manual, and see which metal has a density closest to what you obtain, and you'll say that your unknown is that particular metal. So that's all uh, we have to do in today's experiment. Once you're done with that, please clean up after yourself. Remove, carefully remove the metals from um, the cylinder. So all you have to do is turn it down the sink and let it slide out gently. Take it out, get a paper towel, wipe it, and put it back uh, in your locker. Okay, so once you've cleaned up, then you can go. I hope you enjoy today's experiment.